Hey guys and gals, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Hoosier Kayak Bassin Podcast. We appreciate you hitting that play button and taking a listen. Tonight, we have an awesome guest lined up for you. But before we get into that, we have to make a big announcement. So in the previous episode, we said, hey, we're going to announce a new sponsor. So and now it's time to do that. 316 Active, hands down the best performance fishing jerseys on the market. You got to check them out, guys. They're making quality product at a super affordable price. Jersey starting at just $65, quarter zips for $75. They got a brand new product. It's a waterproof hoodie. I mean, waterproof pockets and everything. Perfect for kayak fishing for just $95. Quick turnaround time, four weeks to your door. You can't beat it. Small business, family owned. Love what they're doing over there at 316 Active. And we really appreciate their support on the show. So go check them out on Facebook. Give them a like. Drop them a comment. Send them a message. Let them know we sent you. You'll get 10% off your next order just for being a follower of Fusion Kayak Bassin. So we really appreciate everything they're doing for us. We're going to go ahead and get into tonight's episode. Tonight's guest. We're going to announce it here in just a second. So get ready. Listen up. Here we go. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Hoosier Kayak Bassin Podcast. This is your host, Sam Jones. Got my co-host, Alan Reed, with me tonight. What's going on, Alan? Oh, just, uh, you know, riding out this cold weather that's set in here. Winter has come upon us. Oh, and it is brutal. I don't want any more of it. I mean... But- yeah, but it's a great time of year to start getting prepped for the season, right? Get every, get your tackle ready, get the kayaks ready, get the fishing poles ready, reels, all that stuff. And we're going to talk about something else tonight to get ready with. That is true. That is true. Big A big piece of the game, whether you're a weekend warrior or a tournament angler, kayaker, or fishing out of a glass boat or aluminum boat tonight's subject is definitely going to uh, be one that you want to listen in on and i think it's going to be insightful and bring a lot of a lot of good content uh to folks that are looking to learn a little bit more about fish finders depth finders graphs all that kind of good stuff so without further ado, let's uh, let's introduce tonight's guest, someone not associated with the uh, the kayak fishing market um, necessarily, but uh, someone who has been putting out and pumping out great fishing related content for some time now, with over twenty eight thousand subscribers on YouTube, Mister. Hank Rogers, the Bass Geek. Ooh, how's Sound it effects. going, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome how to the show, doing? man. <laughs> how's it going, guys? It's good. It's good. It's you know, always we've, we've good. told our our listeners, right? We're going to bring them some different stuff than than a lot of the other podcasts that are out there. We're not just going to stick strictly with everything being kayaks. So here we are, right? Bringing bringing a, a little bit of a kayak outsider in here to teach us something. <laughs> well, I don't know how much I'll teach you guys. I, I always tell everybody when it comes to kayaks, if I see a guy in a kayak in a in a pocket or a cove, generally I just go on past because I know you guys have picked apart every single stitch <laughs> of cover and structure in there, and it's useless <laughs> for me to go in there and fish 100 miles an hour. So I just I'm just like, oh, there's a guy. No, I'm leaving. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome i think that's what's going to be cool about this episode we're going to get cool little like uh little blips of what it 
like the difference, right? We always think yeah. about it from our side, from our point of view. So that right there kind of just shows you the mind of a, a guy in a boat, what he's thinking when he sees a kayaker. So that's cool. Yeah. What else is cool is, you know, this show is sponsored um, in part by TRC Covers. And we got we got kind of like a little TRC Covers powwow going on right now. The so, TRC Trio. The TRC. <laughs> oh, I like it. <laughs> Hashtag TRC trio. There we go. There we go. <laughs> What's fu- <laughs> Mic drop. What's funny is I didn't even realize this uh, until literally just before we uh, we went on air here. I was sitting here thinking I saw Alan's TRC hat that he has on. I'm like, wait a second. We're all on TRC or a part of TRC in some way. So, uh, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, I yeah. really enjoyed joining that team a few years ago. Uh, you know, I tell everybody, you know, I've got the, I've had the, uh, the, the, uh, the opportunity to work a couple of, uh, you know, shows, a couple of expos with TRC, and I tell everybody as they come up and they talk to me, you know, that about two, three years ago, I was using some other brands of uh, rod covers and. You know, I was, uh, I carry a lot of rods now. You guys, I know, you know, on a kayak, you're very limited. It's like me kind of co-angling. It's, it's almost the same thing. But in my boat, I've got about 62 combos <laughs> in my boat. I think I'd be wow. confused. <laughs> so 62 uh, combos. 62 combos. And so. Lord have mercy. <laughs> so, you know. I was I was literally breaking rod tips and 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 you know pulling guides off of my rods, uh, you know with those other brands, and finally I just got fed up with it and started doing some research. And I'll have to give a, a little shout out to my buddy from Bass Munitions. He actually turned me on to TRC, and then that's when I reached out to them. Like you know, let me try your products. He actually showed me a product. He was uh, he was a staff member. And uh, I've been in love with them ever since. I believe in them wholeheartedly. I think they protect those guides. And you know, like like I said, when you're when you're a nut job like myself, and you're carrying sixty two, and and literally, I just got my lose order in, so that will grow. Oh <laughs> I'll have goodness. even more combos in there. But uh, you know, having that protection just in your rod locker and being able to sort things out, it's tremendous, and it, it's it's such a great. Uh, such a huge difference in what protection they actually offer. Oh yeah, they're they're great. They're great. So before we have you kind of do a little introduction yourself, I got to ask something because this is a total different thing, right, between the kayak and the boat, right? So night before tournament, right, we're retying lines, leaders, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you probably can't even fish a day and a half before a tournament, right? Because you got to do all those. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, if I'll tell you what, if if I've got to redo all of those, I'm probably just sitting that tournament out because I'm, I'm, uh, it's done. I don't, if I don't know, if I don't have it whittled down at that point, I'm in trouble. It's going to be a bad, bad day. <laughs> yeah. So, I can't 62. I mean, I, I own a lot of rods, uh, but I don't know that I'm even half. Well, I'm probably half of that, but I definitely don't carry that many on I've the got water. A, yeah. I've got an old Triton. So, both sides are uh, uh, rod, rod lock. lockers. So oh, on this yeah. side is uh, all my spinning combos, and on this side is all my casting combos. Wow. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. It's bad. All right. So, <laughs> so with that, so let, let's let's get to know who who Hank Rogers is. I mean, besides having the name of a, a famous country music artist, or sounds like it anyway. A combo, um, actually. Yeah, exactly. Um, besides that, besides having an amazing 28,000 subscribers on YouTube um, and a world of experience and quite honestly maybe being the per- professor of uh, Humminbird and, and electronics, <laughs> how, before all of that, right, how, how did how this all come to be? You know, how did you come to be the Bass Geek? I was born on a rainy April day. No, no, you know, it's such a weird story because I never planned on, like I've always loved fishing and, you know, I I tell everybody I'm a, I'm a network guy. 
So I love problem solving, you know, that in the, in the IT field, uh, you're, you're always problem solving. And, you know, I, I grew up, my grandfather fished and luckily he had a small, uh, John boat on a small, no wake or, you know, electric motor only lake. And so we kind of grew up using that. And, uh, so, so, you know, maybe not kayaks, but I, you know, I grew up and, and spent most of my life fishing out of small, you know, John boats and small boats on small bodies of water, which is, shoot, excuse me, which is, you know, a lot like what you guys do when you're in those small boats and you can't jump on that big engine and, you know, go for a 15 minute run or a 30 minute run, you know, you, you've got to fish the area that you're in and figure out, you know, where they're at, where they're stacked out there and so that's that's really where i started now what started me in the youtube world was literally i have i coached high school football for 13 years offensive and defensive line and you know i fished forever in a day i mean i've fished since i was i can remember and uh you know i i remember seeing tactical bassing talk about the importance of having a you or having a uh, a gopro and how it's like watching game film and for me i just went ding 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 <laughs> you know because i love in the football world to watch game film and so i was like i was like you know i'm, I'm going to uh I'm, I'm gonna go i'm gonna go get the school's uh camera their sony handy cam and i'm gonna strap it to the back seat of my boat <laughs> <laughs> which is what I did. And, uh, and I went out fishing one day and I'm always being a, a computer geek, you know, I feel like I have a enough memory, you know, to feel like I can remember, you know, pretty much what I was doing, what the retrieve was when I get bit. And, uh, so I'm, I'll never forget. It was the first time I ever fished an Alabama rig. And I threw that thing out there by this stick up in the gut of this uh, little pocket. And it was uh, early, early spring, and I was working it by and had two smallmouth hit it. And that was the first fish I'd ever caught was a double on smallmouth on an A-rig. And, hey, uh, hold on. Pause, yeah. pause, pause. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so your first experience with an Alabama rig, not only was it a, was it a double, but it was yeah. two smallmouth. Yeah, no, they were small, small. I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, they were five pounds. They were, you know, they were... 12 and 13 inches, but hey, it was a double. That <laughs> is great. That yeah, that's awesome. It's been downhill ever since. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, so long story short, basically what ended up happening was uh, uh, also when I was in high school, I did some television productions works. Now, uh, to date myself, <laughs> there. It was all like VHS to VHS back in that day. <laughs> <laughs> there were no computers or, you know, digital cameras. It was all analog and you had little, you know, two VHS tapes and you had to track it frame by frame, you know. So, uh, so I'd done some editing work, you know, and really, really did even love it back then. But we just so, lost about half of our audience there. Yeah, VHS right. What is that? Uh, but, uh, you know, so, 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 you know, I was like, well, there's got to be a way to cut out all this dead time between catches because generally I have a lot of dead time between catches, just, you know, so, you know, uh, but, uh, so I started looking online, found a couple of things, and then a couple of my friends and stuff kind of seen those videos, and they were like, oh, you need to do a YouTube channel. And I'm like, no, like I'm not doing a YouTube channel. I'm like, you don't understand. I'm a gruff, rough, offensive, defensive line coach that cusses at high school kids on the regular every single day. <laughs> <laughs> I said, the first troll, the first 13-year-old troll that jumps on and calls me a blankety fat guy, you know, said, I'm going to be like, look here, son, I'm going to take my belt off and whoop you like your mama should. You know, I, I was, you know, I didn't know how to handle all that stuff. And I really didn't know anything about YouTube. I, I kind of tell people, I kind of force gumped my way into this. And, uh, you know, they talked me into it after probably six months. Uh, because when, when I caught those two smallmouth, I was sure that 
they hit that Alabama rig on the drop. And when I watched that video, it was halfway back to the boat. Mm -hmm. And I noticed I was doing something totally different that I didn't do the rest of the day. By the way, I didn't catch any other fish. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd done something totally different with my retrieve cadence when I caught those two smallmouth too. And I was like, wow, I would have uh, completely been lost. So, you know, tactical bassing, thank you for uh, making me do that. And then my family, I guess, thank you for, you know, uh, and my friends that I work with, thank you for talking me into doing it. So I never thought I'd have 28,000 subscribers. Like that's, I'm blessed. I don't know why anybody wants to listen to a fat redneck, you know, who's, <laughs> clumsy and dumb but <laughs> but it's uh, it's it's a blessing that's a that's something an going for you. take do what you that, got something going for you yeah yeah i you know i guess uh you know if you watch some of my videos and watch me kicking my 400 hundred dollar lose rod over while i'm boat flipping a spook four four and a half pounder <laughs> i guess they just get a good laugh out of me most of the time <laughs> so hmm. uh, I, i'm still caught up on this whole you know watching yourself fish to kind of really see what you're doing out there and then you're talking about that whole alabama rig thing you just wonder how often you think you got it all figured out and in reality you're missing the mark yeah and it's uh a lot more than you than you think and mm referencing that video uh this past summer i had a video that did like forty thousand views in a month and it was uh it was uh top water over a uh, 30 foot ledge and i fish a lot of really really super clear water you know a lot of guys they're like three foot's clear me 15 foot's clear you know i fish water that's mm -hmm. generally 15 to 30 foot visibility now it'll dirty up sure but then I can't catch them. I don't know how to catch dirty water bass. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but, uh, you know, even that, the, the, the head and spook that I was using, I learned really quick. I've seen some fish on the graph over a, uh, uh, creek channel ledge. And for whatever reason, they were suspended at that 15 to 20 foot mark. I was throwing swim baits and under spins, counting them down, trying to get them at that level. And, you know, that, that's worked a lot in the past, but that particular school, they, uh, they just wouldn't have any. And so, you know, I throw a spook out there and I start walking it really super slow, tie a loop knot on it. And, and just, or I'm just walking it. So that as soon as it hits that apex, it's just a slight pause and come back. And, uh, you know, I learned that because a year earlier, I was watching myself throw a spook in the same situation and working it way too fast and missing a lot of them. So I just watched that and I was like, well, I caught the biggest one when I just completely slowed it down. And, you know, it was like a four, which in that lake, a four and a half pound smallmouth is like unheard of. And this mm. huge four and a half pound smallmouth comes up and just clocks it. So, wow. I mean, it was, it was neat. And so you, those cameras, man, even if you're not going to do YouTube or you're not doing it for social media, I'm not sponsored by GoPro or anybody GoPro. I'll make a deal with you. I'm cheap, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, it really has made a, a huge difference in that. And the other thing is posting the videos. Now it's like, you know, everybody talks about keeping that notebook of, you know, days and times and, you know, well, the videos are the most incredible thing because now, you know, I put them in dates and I have this log and I can almost go hit those bites on the head, you know, during this time mm. of year, you can, I can almost schedule the dates of when I can go and this bite is going to be on, on this lake, that lake or the other. So it's, I think that's the Genius. biggest thing for me, man. So that, that ties in perfectly to the seminar that Sam and I did at the Indiana Fish Expo. So if anybody's listening to this, you didn't come out and listen to our seminar there, you missed out on a great thing. Um, it wasn't about videotaping, but it was capturing all that. 
information about when you're fishing and, and, you know, looking at it, referencing it, right. Not just logging it down in a, in a book. And right, that's a whole nother subject. Um, GoPros, that's a whole nother electronics, right. That uh, yeah. we could spend a lot of time talking about. And, uh, but we have a lot of good stuff here to talk about on fish finders. And, uh, I want to make sure we, we get plenty of time to talk about that with you. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, well, I didn't expect to get so many knowledge knowledge bombs dropped before he ever even got to tonight's <laughs> topic, I but uh, it's great. This is great. So, and this is why, this is why Alan um, and I wanted to, to bring some newer um, characters, if you will, into into our podcast because um there's this whole inside the kayak community you know we often are stuck there and there's this whole other group of people who have a lot of great insights and i think as kayakers we have a lot of great insights to share with the boaters as well so it's a cool dynamic but um as alan said we want to have enough time to talk about tonight's main topic which is you know graphs and fish finders and and um all of these electronics that we use on the boat to help us locate fish um, and understand the body of water that we're on. So let's kind of dive into that real quick. And, and, and before we get into anything specific, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you came to be such a expert, if you will, on, on the subject, or at least, why it's so important to you and why you spend so much time teaching others about it. For me, I tell everybody, you know, you, you hear a lot of guys and to me, fish finders, depth finders, they're more important to the weekend warrior than they are to even the professional. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, because as professionals or guides, you spend days on the water as a weekend warrior, you know, we spend a day if we're lucky, two if we're lucky, three if we're really lucky or retired, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, what I try to get people to understand is that a good depth finder and being able to understand a good, good depth finder is going to make you a better angler. You're going to see things you're not going to see by beating the banks or fishing the same spots that you always fish. Uh and for me, since I've fished so many lakes that are super clear, even in those small boats, you know, I had a flasher. That was the first thing I learned. I learned very quickly that in the Highlands Reservoirs where I fish, where, you know, you'd read those Bassmaster magazines back in the, you know, 80s for me in the 90s. And, uh, you know, you would, you'd hear them talk about during the, during the winter time, you know, or during the summer, you know, looking for 45 degree banks. And you're like, they're all 45 degree where I fish. <laughs> they go from 45 to 90. I don't know where these guys are finding flats. Like, I'd like to see what a flat looks like, <laughs> you know, but so, you know, you come to realize, and, and there's no grass in these lakes that I fish, you know, there's very, very little, you know, some blowdowns, you know, that sort of stuff here and there. But you come to realize that a spinner bait, when the water temps are 85 degree, it, you know, a half ounce spinner bait in white and sour truce when the water clarity is 15 foot deep and you can see every single limb of that tree, <laughs> you know, not really mm -hmm. your best option. And mm -hmm. so, so what you end up learning is how graphs, you know, are going to help you out. And like I said, I mean, I've, I learned on, on literally a flasher and then went to a, a an all gray, uh, gray screen Lawrence, uh, and, you know, just kind of have progressed through the years, but those things, while those guys were fishing those, uh, their spinner baits on the bank, you know, I was out there in the center of those Creek channels and, and catching those bass that were schooled up and that nobody knew were out there. Very cool. So, we have a lot of people in the kayak world that are just starting to get into the sport. And so 
I want to make sure we cover just the very basics, right? Let's go to the very beginning, right? You're going to go out there and you're going to buy your first fish finder. What is that, right? What what are your, what is your considerations? Um, I always tell everybody, and it, it's different for everybody because you know they can get pricey. The two things that I tell people most of the time is, you know, number one, spend as much as you can because screen size does matter. Screen size does matter. You know, when when you're, I was fishing I guess a week a week ago and you know I'm fishing for smallmouth that have uh, shad pinned down in the guts and they're they're 80 foot deep now you can imagine what that's going to look like on a five inch screen <laughs> yeah you're not yeah, going to yeah. see those fish you know uh, so so it matters so to start out get as much as you can afford don't don't go cheap there's plenty there's plenty of great options out there on the used market now you you know used markets you got to be careful but you know do your homework see it work uh don't take their words but uh, honestly i can't stress enough how important the larger the screen is the better the resolution the better off you're going to be and the more things you're going to see and find mm. right right so just kind of go to the next piece of it, right? So there's a lot of uh, technology out there today, right? There's a lot of terms, a lot of different views and those kind of things, right? So um, what's your recommendation there? Right? You got traditional sonar, every, everything's going to come with that, right? You got your down imaging, uh, which is pretty commonplace there today. Um, side imaging. For me, you know, I love, I love my side imaging. And on Hummingbird, I mean, I, I can honestly tell you on Hummingbird, Hummingbird side imaging is far and away better than I think any other side imaging on the market. Uh, and, and not because of Mega, just because the way the crystals in the transducers are positioned, uh, the, the cone angles, all that sort of geeky stuff I can get into. Now, from a kayak perspective, uh, the thing about a good image on down and side imaging, and the one thing you've got to constantly remember is that those cones are not like the traditional 2D sonar, so they're not a perfectly round cone. That's why you can put a, uh, a sonar a transducer, a 2D transducer, on, a, on, a, uh, on the bottom of a trolling motor and that trolling motor can spin all day that cone is is circular as it goes down on a side image and a down image and hits credit card thin so it's it's very oval elongated and that's mm. why a lot of times when like i don't run uh i don't run down imaging on my uh trolling motor and the reason why is because you get a lot of blur. And if you're sitting still, it's really, it's, it's just not, I, I would, I can see more with my 2D image. I've already went across the fish. I've already found those fish at my console. So with my, my trolling motor, you know, it's not a big deal. Now for the kayak guys, you know, I, it comes down to to get a good image out of down imaging and side imaging. It really does come down to speed because you really do have to hit about low end. If you've got that transducer set up just right, I'd say what, and you guys know this better than me about two miles an hour, two and a half, three. Uh, yeah, I can get, yeah, I can get great images at two. Okay. So that's, I figured if you've got it dialed, really dialed in for your kayak, I figured you could get it at about two. Uh, but normally, you know, and, and for us boat guys, I know a way to get it at higher speeds on plane, but generally you lose at about five right. uh, miles per hour. Um, mm. So that's kind of the sweet spot. And so, you know, as a kayak angler, I would think, and again, this is all assumption. You guys correct me if I'm wrong, you know, going with that, that side imaging and people, the one question I get about side imaging is, can you find fish? 
I find fish at 100 feet out, at 115 feet out. You know, of course, a lot of that is going to depend on bottom contour and bottom content. But, you know, <clears throat> side imaging, at least with Hummingbird, uh, I, because I came from Lawrence, and, and I'll be the first to tell you, Lawrence, they've got a better down imaging. Generally, they have had better down imaging. Now, that changed once Mega come out because what ended up happening was Mega finally found a way, Hummingbird finally found a way to put a third down imaging crystal. And I talked to a lot of guys about Garmin. You don't see a lot of pros going Garmin all the way around. And the biggest reason why is because their down imaging is what is not true down imaging. And what I mean by that is it's actually a computer rendered version of what's actually down there. It's a computer rendered based on their 2D and what they see from their side image. So it's kind of fill in the blank. And when I first got into Hummingbird from Lawrence, I was really, excuse my French, but pissed off <laughs> at my down imaging uh, because I was so used to Lawrence's good down imaging. And I went right to the Helix units. And at that time, it was a price thing because I could get two Helix 9s for the price of one uh, uh, Lawrence HDS 3 at the time, 9. And uh, so I was like, well, I'll just upgrade both of them because I had one of my one of my Hummingbird or my Lawrence units on the bow die. And so I had a little bit of a learning curve. But after they went to the Gen 2 Helixes with that Mega Crystal, uh, I can't say that I'm anything but happy with Hummingbird. I mean, it's uh, incredible. I think it's the right now probably the closest to a total package uh, when it comes to sonar so so i tell people that's what you want to go to and they've even got now what the, the hummingbirds they've even got uh megas down to the sevens which is incredible yeah so yeah so kind of going back to what we were touching on there right, with the side imaging and how far you can see out to the side right i think personally that's even more important for us kayakers because you're covering a couple hundred feet out to the each side, right? And, and we can't cover near as much water as you can in a boat, right? But now you're covering all kinds of of uh, acreage, right? Yeah. You're cruising down through there, being able to see that stuff. So uh, personally for me, I think that's really critical. I know uh, kind of going to what you're saying about the speed. I've heard a lot of boat guys, you know, say, oh, you know, you guys can't get a good image on a kayak. Well, I, I got snapshots. I'll prove it to you, right? It's, yeah, it's I, there. We're capable. I couldn't believe anybody would say that. I don't, I mean, I've got a, listen, I've got a, I actually got a small boat to go back and fish some of these lakes, these smaller lakes I grew up on. I actually bought that, a little uh, uh, Pelican Bass Raider. And mm -hmm. so the very first thing I did was I went ahead and bought me a second transducer for my Mega 10 <laughs> to rig up on that little boat. And it right. got, nice. I've had it out once. I finally got it done later in the year. And I mean, it's got incredible images on it of a lake that I've grew up fishing. And as soon as I was out there, I was like, oh my God, look at that. I never knew that was there. Right. <laughs> so, Interesting. Um, so keeping with the, the theme, right? So we've gone sonar, down imaging, side imaging, mapping, and GPS. What? Mapping right. and GPS, uh, it is, it is a, it has become a battle royale in the industry. I actually, uh, you know, I love, and, and I feel like I've left uh, a girlfriend because I just now have, I've just now had the opportunity to go with Lake Master uh, because there was three of the core lakes in the BFL uh, region that I fish. Uh, that they just now this past year finally mapped in high definition. So, uh, so the ability, what is it? C map with Lawrence, those mm -hmm. maps. I, I know several guys that have those, uh, those come out after I left Lawrence and, uh, those are incredible. What I've seen with those and the ability to, uh, change your contour colors. Uh, same goes with the Lake Master, which you've been able to do that for a long time. But one of the things, and the new Lawrence's now do this too, 
but the auto chart live feature for Humminbird. Uh, you don't hear a lot of people talk about it. I think it's probably one of the most underutilized pieces of equipment on the Humminbird. But to be able to go out there and, and map, make your own map of a area, especially when we're talking about, you know, deeper water, offshore stuff, you know, uh, of a point or a hump or, a, uh, you know, a ledge. It's uh, it's pretty pretty interesting what you can do with that. So we probably need to just point out for our listeners, right, that that you know the uh, the Lake Master and the Sea Map and the uh, auto charting, right? You got to have a zero uh, zero line card, right? I mean, so those are all add on things, right? So you're gonna you ever have a card that you're gonna have uh, you know an SD port for on your on your fish finder, right? So it, it's yep. not all coming there. It's not all accessible, yep. right? That you can kind of play Navionics cards too, right? And so there's another player in the, in the mapping industry. Now, here's an interesting thing I just heard um, when we were down in Georgia for the tournament, right? So somebody had just bought a new uh, Helix Gen 3, right? And you got two card slots and they were running a Navionics card and a Lake Master card and moving back and forth between them because they have a little bit different stuff on them. Mm. That's, that's very interesting. And I mean, it, it does all start with maps. I mean, if, 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 if you're to me, I mean, if you're, you're, you've got any chance of, of, you know, catching fish on a new body of water, the very first thing you're going to have to do is study some sort of map. I mean, you're going to have to find those key areas, uh, yeah. You know, whether that be the Navionics, and, and that's something that I use, the Navionics uh, web, free web app, which you can access on a computer. Uh, they've, they've got like a, what is it, a 9.99, I think, for like the phone app. And I mean, th those things are awesome, uh, you know, because it's it's really hard to carry your graph around and get to look at your sea maps all the time or your, <laughs> your Lake Master. So, right. uh, you know, that's a nice little option just to do some study while you're you know, riding home from work or something, not driving, not driving, riding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so just to, to cover a little bit of other technology stuff that's out there, right? We're going to, there's HDS live. Mm -hmm. um, have you had the opportunity to use that? I've not used Lawrence's. I've, I've seen a lot from it. Uh, I've, I've got to see it. I've got to, uh, have a, have a buddy of mine talk about it. Um, that technology, I'll say from what I, from comparison to the Garmin live scope and uh, pan optics, That's it seems to be, <laughs> it seems to be in its infancy right now uh, compared to, to the Garmin setup. Right, right. So you brought it up, right? Have you had the opportunity to use the Garmin pan optics or live scope? Yes. Now I, I get a lot of questions about the 360 mega I, and I'll tell you again, uh, I've got the 360 gen one, I guess they're not calling it that, but the, the 455. And so if we talk about just to, to give you a quick rundown on frequency, frequency is the strength. If you're in a dark room and you've got a flashlight and it's got three settings on it, 455 is the strongest, 800 is the happy medium, and mega is the weakest signal of the bunch. So they will penetrate water uh, less and less as you go higher and higher in the numbers. So the one problem that I had, again, fishing a Highland Reservoir with the Gen 1, it was only a 455, 360 scan, and so you would be facing a steep point and it would just be blown out. <laughs> and then behind you, it would just be completely dark. <laughs> so right. it's really tough. It, it works great. The Gen 1s work great in those, those flatter areas, uh, those Florida style lakes, you know, a lot of grass, uh, bowl style lakes, you know, or those Tennessee River lakes on those ledges, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, 
they're they're great at finding structure. Now, they've upgraded to the Mega, and the great thing about the Mega is it's a weaker signal, but it's better definition. And that means you're going to get better separation, a clearer picture, but it's not going to reach as far out. Uh, and, and now when we talk about pan optics, this is the question I get a lot from people when, when we're talking about the Garmin versus the 360 is, you know, which one do you think is better? I think they're very much different tools. Uh, pros of a 360, you, uh, you're seeing 360 degrees around the boat. Now you can zoom in and see just in front of you if you're moving. You can see fish, but it's not uh, quote unquote live. It's more like, you, you know, you've seen the old pictures of the uh, radar, uh, you know, from like the old airplane movies or whatever. I know, again, man, most people don't know what in the <laughs> heck that is. But anyway, the old radar, you know, it'd, it'd have the scope that twirl. Well, that's basically what the 360 is. Now, a negative to that is, is you've got that unit and you're seeing 360. So think about the massive area. If you've got that rolled out to 50 feet, 80 feet, 100 feet, all the way around your boat, you have to have a dedicated unit truly to be able to see those and, and use those things. Uh, and, and when I say a dedicated unit, I mean, standing on the front of the boat. Now, you, again, kayak guys, you're, you can, I don't know, you're probably a little closer to your units in most cases. You know, me, you know, I'm getting old, you know, so my eyes ain't as good as they used to be. <laughs> so I got to I gotta get those up off the bottom and get, get the most screen as I can get because you're seeing all that, all that, you know, part of the lake. And if you don't have a 10 or 12, you know, again, what I said earlier, you're losing resolution and therefore you're not seeing things that a guy with a 10 or 12 will see. Now, I'm not saying as a beginner you have to have that, of course, but since we're sure, talking sure. about that. Now, no, I pan don't think most kayaks out there are going to fit a 12 on it very <laughs> yeah, good either. Yeah. <laughs> then you get up into uh, those big old 16s and you yeah, get a big screen yeah. TV up there in front of you. You can't catch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we yeah. can't all be Jacob Wheeler and run a Garmin yeah. and a Hummingbird <laughs> and a Lorance yeah. all at the front yeah. and all at the, <laughs> yeah, at right. the, uh, at right. the console, now, but... Now, the great thing about the live scope is, is that it's really live. Now, everybody's like, well, this is a game changer, but they don't really tell you why it's a game changer. And let me tell you why it's a game changer. So the, let me give you the con. The con is it's like a flashlight. So you're not seeing 360 degrees around. You're pointing it at what you want to see. So it's, it's on your trolling motor and you have to point it in the direction. Now, let's say if I'm out there ledge fishing. Point I've your got trolling motor. At yes. the direction of. It, yeah, exactly. And so let's say I'm out there ledge fishing. I've got a, a wind blowing me in the wrong direction of the current or the fish, you know, and and I've got spot lock. So what ends up happening, you just spend all that money on something that has spot lock, but you just nullified that completely because now you have to point your, your trolling motor and that transducer mm -hmm. that's mounted directly to it, toward it. Right. So... So, so to, to, to just translate this for the kayak guys, right? So, so the reason that you have to port your trolling motor, right, is because on a boat, you got your transducer mounted onto your trolling motor shaft, right? And so it's moving mm -hmm. around there. But so, I mean, we can work around that a little bit on a kayak, right? I mean, we can we can have a separate arm and have something yeah. there. We're kind of adjusting it and things like that. Or you, you know, I haven't seen anybody mount it to the front of a kayak. I've kind of seen that arm off to the side, and they can kind of spin it around that way, but just to try to make that translation over to what's going on in a boat versus a kayak. Yeah. And so now here's how it's really a game changer because it is live. It's not that you see the fish on that. It's not that you see them any better. It's that you see their reactions to the bait and the retrieve. Now think about that. You're seeing in live time, if I pull up on a bunch of fish in 30, 40 foot of water and I throw my swim bait, I'm not guessing how many are actually following it back now. I'm not guessing at which ones are taking a swipe at it or if it's one fish out of that school that's taking a swipe at it. I get to see when I change retrieves live how those fish react. Now, think, I mean, think about that. that I mean, that blows my mind.
Right. You that's like to, a true video game fishing. Yes. You know, that's how it's going to change the game. You know, is that you get to see in real time how they react to your retrieve. So you can adjust your retrieve. There's no more guessing. There's no more guessing. You can adjust mm-hmm. your retrieve to make those fish bite. Right, right. That's insane. Interesting. Wonder how long it'll be until we see all of the big three with that technology, you know, or a uh, better adaptation of it. That's going to be the challenge, right? Because I'm sure it's a protected technology. And so yeah. it's going to be the same thing like Lowrance on the down imaging. And how do you come up with the technology that does the equivalent thing? isn't exactly the same so you don't get in the lawsuits and all that kind of stuff yep yep yeah yeah interesting they definitely all three have something to offer and you just got to figure out what matches up with your your style the best i guess um because uh i mean and if you want a another resource to finding and understanding what makes them different and why guys choose um, major league fishing did do an article with Jacob and he also has done a video on his setup and why he goes with what he's gone with here uh, and why he's chosen to use all three and what he uses them for. So that's another great resource for you all to look at. Um, I, I want to get into something a little bit different here though. Now, so I go out and I decide I want to get the hummingbird. Say I get a helix. Um, so I've got it all now. I've got down sand. I've got side. I've got all the great mapping stuff. How and when do I use the features? When do I use side scan? When do I use down scan? When do I use traditional? What screen setup should I be looking at? I mean, I'm fresh. I'm just beginning, right? Where do I start? Well, the great thing, and again, this does go back to to screen size. And the great thing about it is, if you're you saying size a, matters. <laughs> I do. I am oh. saying size matters. <laughs> <laughs> now we're now we're gonna follow it up with, but it's also how you use it. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> yeah, it it is true. That is true. Because, you know, in the boating world, I, I'll be the first to tell you, man, I have got in so many boats. You know, I, I've fished as a co-angler on the BFL uh, for two, three years. And, you know, I've got in some boats with some guys and uh, they've got, you know, tens of thousand dollars worth of graph and have no clue how to use them <laughs> whatsoever. I, I can tell the water uh, temperature. Yeah. And- uh, until how deep it the bottom is. Down there. What else do I need to know? Like, <laughs> Let me go throw my spinner bait in that six <laughs> inches of water. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but you know, size does matter, <laughs> so, and and just because of resolution mainly, you know, you're you're going to be able to see that stuff in deeper water. And you're fishing a lot of shallower water. Again, you're fishing Lake Okeechobee. I don't even know that you need a graph <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, when do you use them? As a beginner, down imaging is going to be probably your biggest ally because it's so hard to take somebody out and explain to them what they're seeing on 2D sonar because it's just a bunch of reds and greens and blues and yellows and lines and, you know, how do you know, uh, you know, and, and side imaging is going to be your biggest ally because you're going to be able to see. You know, is that a brush pile or a car over here that I'm fishing? I'm hitting with my crankbait, you know, I mean, (laughs) you can tell. Um, You know, and that's really where you're going to start. That down imaging is going to be the first thing you're going to fall in love with. Then then you're going to learn a lot about that side imaging. You're going to get better with it. And and then eventually that'll translate into your, your 2D sonar as a beginner in today's technology world. I didn't have that option in my old olden days <laughs> but uh you know uh but now where i use my sonar the most because again you know i talked about the flashlight and the frequencies well 
you know, sonar, 2D sonar is even stronger frequencies. You know, they they run at what 280, 255 or something like that. And uh, you know, so so when I'm out there, you know, I was talking about fishing for smallmouth that had shad pinned down in a gut of a of a pocket and 80 foot deep. I can see on that sonar the bass inside that 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 shad that are really in the inside that ball of shad down there if i know how to tweak it out just right even at those depths now that's something you're not going to see with uh with that down imaging or that side imaging so so how do you make out the difference uh, and, and this is this is difficult because we're it's verbal communication here we have nothing to show but describe how you're able to discern the difference between shad and bass and crappie and bluegill and all these sorts of things on 2D. Let's start with 2D because I think at least most people have at least a 2D sonar on, on, on their kayak or their boat. So how do you do that? The biggest thing, and there's... I always tell people there's exceptions to the rules. Uh, I can take you to a lake where there's a stump about the size of a truck bed and bass stack like crappy on it. <laughs> they literally stack up like crappy. And, uh, you know, so there's always exceptions to the rules. Generally shad, you know, I like to throw swim bait. So I target areas where shad are, where fish are actively feeding on shad, on bait fish. Uh, they're a cloud. They just look like a big ball or a big cloud. Uh, you know, a lot of times what people will make mistakes with in a 2D sonar is brush piles. And it looks like, you know, it'll look like a bunch of arches because fish on a 2D sonar, I don't know that there's really, I mean, they'd have to be better than me at it. And I'm sure there's guys out there that are, but it's you're you're never ever absolutely 100 percent, and that is a a misnomer and, and i i i have yet to see a guy unless he's just fished that and caught shat, caught fi, uh, bass out of it if you're on a new lake you are never 100 percent sure that it's bass or crappy or whitefish or you know whatever sometimes you just got to go fish for them and but there are telltale signs you know bass will stack but they won't stack they're sort of a you know, there'll be two or three off the bottom and they'll be kind of elongated. You know, sand bass, white bass, they tend to really hunker to the bottom and be, you know, just real tight catfish kind of does the same way. You'll see just barely little arches on them. Uh, you know, crappy, they tend to get over top of or in brush and they tend to stack upwards, you know, in high columns, almost like they're sitting on each other's heads. Um... I don't know. That's, I mean, that's about it. And, and, and like you said, I, I do have a ton of videos. That's one thing in my videos that I try to do is every time I go out on the water, I show you what these bass look like on the 2d on the side image and on the down image. And I, I will, I will literally sit there and point at what's a road bed, what's a ditch, what's a Creek channel. Uh, my viewers, seem to really like that a lot so i try to and get where, do we, find, much. where do we find that hank uh bass geek uh on youtube <laughs> all so, right all right if you just google bass geek you will find my ugly face i promise <laughs> 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 so no it's uh, it, i mean that's really good information to have out there for people to do that right and, and one of the other things is you go out there and you find something like that and try to catch it right yeah and and then you find what it is and you're going to find out that it's bass or it's catfish or right whatever yeah. like that that mm -hmm. um you know is it, go, is it what you're going after uh, and then how about uh you know as tournament anglers right we're all going out there looking for those big fish right so how about distinguishing the size of fish on those different technologies now, in Hummingbird, there is on their 2D, they say, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I believe this. Uh, and, and again, frequency does matter. 
you'll see me a lot of times if I'm in a, uh, if I'm on a lake, like a lot of the lakes that I fish, if I'm on a lake where there's not a lot of bottom, bottom cover, so we're not talking about brush piles. We're not talking about uh, grass. You know, something that is going to be out. It's it's mainly structure. So it's some sort of rock, soft bottom, hard bottom, you know, something like that. A lot of times I'm going to use that 455. And the, and the reason why is because since that is so bright or such a, a uh, strong signal, it really makes those fish pop. Now, here's the downfall to that on, on down imaging and side imaging. It doesn't separate them as well from the bottom. But during the wintertime, I'm fishing so deep, that's where I rely on my 2D sonar. So that 2D sonar, it's still strong, but and it really comes into to learning your palettes on 2D sonar. Uh, for example... I come from Lorance, so even on Hummingbird, I use that kind of traditional yellow to red uh, uh, palette. Uh, all that being said, if I use that palette, there's also a palette that's got some green. I don't remember the exact number, but it really shows fish when they're barely on the bottom. It's that green tends to separate them really well. Wait, so you mean I don't choose the palette just because I think it looks cool? <laughs> sometimes i do pick them just because they're pretty i wish they put butterflies and flowers on them but i don't know uh, they don't <laughs> so just a little bit for those that don't understand this whole palette discussion right so that's kind of the you know it's a color scheme right talk just a little bit about what those colors mean let's use the traditional kind of thing right i think most people can relate to that so the traditional 2d I, and and you'll have to r refresh my memory because I swear I'm going, I'm having a, excuse my language again, a total brain fart right here. But generally, as it goes from, I believe it's red to yellow, yellow being the hardest. Is that right or am I flip-flopping red, that? Red's the hardest. Red's the hardest. That's right. Okay, flip-flopping. My dyslexia kicking in on me. <laughs> so generally, and you you can even tell bottom content. Uh, you can tell how big that fish is by how much. And again, this is true. Oh, there's so much contradiction in, in, uh, in the electronics world because a lot of it does depend on everybody. I get a lot of questions where people ask me, well, why ain't I getting full arches? Well, a lot of that depends on how you cross the fish, which direction the fish is headed. You're going to get a half arch. You know, if that fish is, is crossing you horizontally or or if he's heading in the same direction or you know you only get a full arch i believe it is if they're coming straight at you and you're going straight across them so that it yeah, reads it from that. one side from head to tail or exactly. vice versa from tail to head yeah uh and 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 other times it, it has to do with your speed too you know if you're on a boat and you're going a little too fast you're not going to get a full arch uh because you're not giving your pings time to enough time to read but, uh, dang, I sidetracked myself. What was the original <laughs> question? Well, let's kind of go back. Right. So under the original uh, color palette, right? So you oh, yeah, start yeah. out, you have the, the, that red, right? And that's an indication of a really hard surface with a really strong return, yeah. right? That's your rock bottom and your things like yeah. that, right? And you go to the yellows and uh, on down all the way to the, the other side, which oh. I'm not sure what the softest one is. Uh, yeah, it's green, maybe something like that. Green or blue, right? It's down in that that color scheme. I think right? it's blue. I think it's blue. Yeah, but and, uh, and that's, that's sad. I was just staring at this and even have pictures on my Instagram of it right now. <laughs> <laughs> but generally, what you're going to see is you're going to see red with a, a yellow center. If you get a, a, we'll say a good arch, a good size fish. Uh, the most of the time, the way I tell is the more yellow inside that red, the bigger the fish is. So the more color inside, you know, you'll have a good solid red line, and then you'll have that yellow, that softer color inside of that arch. And so the bigger arch. Now, you know, fishing vertical, you're not going to get arches at all. It's just going to be lines. 
and you'll see the same thing. You'll see the same thing. Uh, and you know, I've got all kinds of pictures of this stuff, like on my Instagram, which is Bass Geek Fishing, too, and my Facebook, which is Bass Geek Fishing, I think. <laughs> Again, just, you'll find me. <laughs> but, we'll link it all, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's all kinds of pictures, you know, that I, because I love putting up transducer pictures of fish, you know, I just think it's, it's so cool. But uh, most of the time, that's how you're going to tell how much color is in between that hard uh outside line and how big and thick that arch is right now that's one thing just kind of going back to this color scheme right that's so that's one thing that you can tell on 2d sonar that you can't tell on let's say a down image is right the down image you you can't tell if that's really a hard bottom right because you don't have that color difference where <laughs> we're on that 2d you it can is, right? it's very you easy it. oh man that's rock boom you got it yeah, no, that's over, pretty. <laughs> For you guys that can't bit. see, uh, Sam's holding up a uh, image of uh, some nice, nice arches and what appears to be at the top, uh, some shad. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but yeah, you're right uh, because you do have the the such a range in color and like you know Sam showing us that traditional Lawrence which is a, a red to a, to a blue and blue being the softest part of the bottom. Uh, you can in certain instances and on the down imaging and the side imaging tell if it's hard or soft, but you also have to be careful with that on down imaging and side imaging because if the, if the bottom of the lake is falling away from you or getting deeper, it's going to look darker. If it's, if it's coming up, it's going to look brighter and therefore appear harder. So you really have to learn to tweak those settings to look at it. Uh, and again, Bass Geek on YouTube, go look. <laughs> right. So yeah. before we really jump into to the settings piece of it, right, which we're going to, I think, kind of jump into next, kind of going into a little bit, right, you've talked about the flashlight analogy here. Right, and and the reason that you get that stronger return, that brighter image when when you have that that slope up, right, is kind of like a mirror, right? So you shine that flashlight at it, and if it's coming straight back at you, all that light's coming back to you, right? Or if that's tilted away, or it's it's at lesser of an angle away from you, right? It's not returning as much there, right? So that's what that's what all this is, is right? Send a beam out. It's bouncing off something and coming back to you. Exactly. I could not have put, actually, I'm going to steal that from you. So, <laughs> See, I told you, we're gaining stuff from the boat side, boat sides, gaining stuff from us. This is working out perfectly. <laughs> I could not have said that better. And now I will be able to. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, I'm taking that 100%. That was perfect. Yeah. 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 So, so we kind of jumped in here, right? And you kind of started to jump into this. You're out there. Now, every one of these things comes up with an auto setting, right? You got something that's kind of come out of the box. Um, and they work. I mean, you, right, you can get an image, but you can make it better, right? Oh, yeah. So, so let me jump into a little bit about where are you starting? Cause there's a lot of settings, right? We don't have time to go through everything, right? But let's hit some of those basics. Forgive me, guys. I gotta whew, readjust here. Um, you know, and and I do have like very in depth uh, videos on settings for the home emerge for the helixes. Uh, that's what I run. I'm not lucky enough to be able to afford those big pretty Solexes yet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, probably the first thing. And I, I tell everybody this is uh, don't overwhelm yourself. The Helix units really right out of the box. They're right there. I mean, they are so close. The very first thing I would say, begin to trim down. Uh, if you're running Lowrance, you're not going to understand this because Lowrance, most of it is, is touch screen and, and that's probably the one thing that coming over from Lawrence to and people that jump in the Helix units, I warn them of greatly is how much they're going to hate that. Uh, 
because the helix units are push button or not touch screen. And when you jump from that, you know, touch screen Lawrence and Lawrence really does the touch screen probably better than anybody else out there. Uh, you're going to cycle through menus and views and those views to on the, on the helix units, go whittle those stupid things down. <laughs> you know, I mean, everybody like people don't understand how important that is because especially if you're on a kayak and you've got one unit, you, you're, you're good for me. If it was me, I'd be changing views constantly. I'd be jumping back and forth between a full down image so I could get a little more detail, then back to my map and my sonar and my, you know, quad screen. And, you know, that's one of the biggest reasons I run two units at my console is so I don't have to do that. Uh, again, size matters, <laughs> you know, and, and, and screen size. And so, you know, the, the more you can see, the better, the better it's going it, to, you're, the resolution is going to be, but uh, that is probably the number one thing that I'm going to tell people is to go in there and whittle down because you can turn off each of those views and only use, you don't need all those views, cut them off. That way you can switch back and forth to those views that you are going to use quickly and easily and make yourself more efficient at the things you're looking at. Uh, without, without going through a lot of the other settings, uh, you know, so let me I, throw throw one in here for you, right? So I think on a kayak side, right, we don't run as fast as you do, mm -hmm. right? So we got to slow our scroll speed way down. Yes, and that's so, something that even, uh, you know, from my console, I'm running my scroll speeds at five, so at pretty much the same speed that I'm, uh going across things and I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm scanning things, you know, uh, as fast as I can go when I'm setting up the steering wheel, got the big motor, but now on the front, I've got it run at two to three and that's, I slow it down because a lot of times I'm going to be stationary. I'm going to be vertical fishing or, you know, I'm going to be casting out, you know, during the summertime ledge fishing and, uh, you know, so I'm not moving on that trolling motor near as fast as I am on that big motor. Right. And that's one of those things that can be a little bit deceiving if you don't get it right to your speed, right? Because then you're going to have things stretched out or a lot smaller than what they are. Yes. You're have things look a lot different than what you, what they really are down there. And that goes back to what we were saying about not getting a full arch sometimes or a very short arch you know, as opposed to, to that nice little, you know, rainbow curve that everybody wants. <laughs> right. So. You get that scroll speed wrong and you're, you're not going to see, you know, what you want. Now I will say this, a caveat to that. If I am vertical fishing, I do turn my scroll speed up because I want to see, and, and something else, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a setting in the Hummingbirds and in the Lawrence's called RTS window, which is real time sonar. So I don't actually look at what's on in the sonar window. I'm looking, it's almost like a vertical flasher because that actually set, lets me see my bait drop and it lets me see the fish that are on the bottom. So I want that just a touch faster on those Hummingbirds when I'm fishing out there, you know, 40, 50 foot. Because even at 40 or 50 foot, you've got such a wide cone angle, you know, by the time you get down there, you know, that, uh, you know, you're, you're not, you're not going to lose a lot of, uh, you know, those arches or, or whatever. It's just going to be straight lines pretty much anyway. And so I want to see it happening as quickly as I can see it happening. And so that's why a lot of times I will run it just slightly higher most of the time in the winter because I'm fishing a lot deeper during the winter time because I'm fishing for smallmouth most of the time. So, all right. So I have a question um, because I, we're going into a lot of the technical stuff, which I'm, I'm glad we are. Yeah. I think a lot of our listeners will gain a lot from that. But I also want to make sure we're touching on stuff for more, maybe the novice. So 
cool, I got this unit, whether it's just 2D or it's the full on everything, right? And I'm seeing stuff down there and I, I'm starting to understand what grass looks like and what rock looks like and stumps look like and fish and bait fish and all that. But now I need to figure out where it is in relation to me. You know what I'm saying? I think for a lot of times for people that, it, and I've heard it so often, that's the thing they most struggle with. Now I see it. I know it's there, but I don't know exactly where it is in relation to me. Is it directly underneath me? Is it behind me? Is it to the right of me, to the left of me? How far? So kind of talk about how to start understanding that and breaking that down because no point in finding it if you can't key in on them and cast to them. All right. So the very first thing I tell everybody, have two buoys in your boat. I, <clears throat> GPS, and I, I, can, I, I can take you out. GPS is not always accurate as they, they like to say it is. It's accurate most of the time at the time. <laughs> but I've made passes in pockets that are, you know, high hills, cloudy days. A lot of things can, can affect that GPS. Uh, <clears throat> so I use buoys to this day. Uh, to me, to get your line up, what I like to do is once I find that spot that I want to go across, you know, for me, I'm an offshore guy. I fish offshore. I fish deep. That's, that's kind of my bread and butter. So when I go out, whether it be a point, a hump, a creek channel, whatever, and I find those fish, <clears throat> I have two things, three things on my hummingbird. I have my uh, range lines set up. So I always have my lines set up on my down image so I can tell about how deep they are and how far they are out to the side. Now, I will tell you this, on side imaging, and I get this question a lot, if I'm driving by something, how far is that group of fish back here behind me? I can tell you how far they are out to the side, but you cannot calculate how far behind and to the side they are because you have to be going the same speed constantly to be able to do that. Uh, so when you see them, what I do is generally I go across. I've got a buoy in my hand. Once I've, I've seen them, I wait until I get past the fish past that school then i throw a buoy out just off to the side let it sit there i back off come back around and now on the front of my boat i set my there's casting rings and i do drop a waypoint on those on those fish so i, I drop i throw the buoy hit a waypoint i come back around and i line up and for me i'm always going to line up my first line up it is always going to be the natural, if you're fishing a reservoir, anything that might have any sort of current and you're out deep, even if the wind is blowing, I'm going to set up in the natural where I cast toward and bring back with the natural current of, mm, of the mm -hmm. lake or the creek. That's where mm -hmm. I'm generally going to start. Now, after that, you know, I set up on my front unit, I set up casting rings. So on Hummingbird, I generally will set up a 30 foot casting ring or a 30, yeah, 35 foot casting ring. So that tells me that from one side of that casting ring to the other, it's 70 feet. I know with about anything, I'm going to be able to pull up to that and make a 70 foot cast <laughs> or and probably a lot longer because if I'm fishing those, Again, like to throw, you know, soft plastic swim baits. If I'm fishing those bass and they're down there, I don't want to cast right on top of their head with a swim bait. I want to throw it past them and bring it through them. And so once I move the boat around and I get bit, that's where that second buoy comes into play. I, I kick that second buoy over. That gives me the lineup where I'm getting bit. So as far as... You know, even you guys, uh, to have you, you know, a, a buoy where you're getting bit from, uh, you know, 
and and one that is your target. And you got to remember, I always put my target slightly past where I'm going to be casting. That mm -hmm. way I'm not dropping it right on those fish's head. So now I've got a true lineup right there from one buoy where I'm casting from and to another buoy where I'm casting just short of. So I don't have to go through the whole triangulating, you know, which I can do, but, uh, you know, if I got two buoys, why not? Right. <laughs> but that as a, as a beginner, those buoys are invaluable to you. Go out and get you some buoys and, and drop them out there and, and learn your lineup that way. Because, you know, it's, it's hard to understand. And a setting in the electronics is a lot of the settings come north up by default. You want that to be heads up. So it is pointing in the direction. Now, with Lowrance and Hummingbird, if you're using the uh, GPS antenna built inside, it does not have a compass built into it. So let's say you are on the water and your kayak is being blown from left to right. My other left to right. There we go. <laughs> if you're being blown left to right, all of a sudden your, your, your uh, indicator, your boat indicator on your map will turn and start going. And if you've got heads up, it'll turn the whole map. So now it looks like you're actually heading to your right when you're not. So the other thing is, and I don't know how important it is again to you guys, uh, but the, uh, what's it called? The plus one on the mm -hmm. Lowrance, mm -hmm. having that little puck with that compass in it uh, when you're lining up is hugely important. And with Hummingbird, it's just the uh, GPS plus compass little puck. So, and the, another key, you want to make sure that it's away from anything that's magnetic. So if your kayak's got an electric motor on it, most electric motors use magnets. So you don't want it too close to those things. Good insights. Good to know. Good to know. So using the old buoy trick to help triangulate <laughs> those, those fish is, is definitely a, uh, a good tip and it's something that I use um, as well. So. All right, very cool. Alan, what you got? Um, just going back a little bit um, on some of these settings inside here, right? So a lot of times you, you head out and you kind of get this staticky, snowy look, right? You can tell at the bottom there, you see this stuff, right? Um, right? There's adjustments you can do to clean up that image. Um, really basic stuff, right? Sensitivity. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. And, and you, you'll, you'll get that. I know I get it on a particular lake in the summer a lot. Uh, when I first seen it, I thought it was a, a, a thermocline and that's actually something that you, you need to know too. And a 2d, it shows up much better. It'll actually show up on a down imaging too, but if you're fishing during the summer, you can actually turn your, uh, uh, your sensitivity up when you're in that 2D sonar setting and it'll actually show kind of this false bottom for lack of a better term. Uh, and, and that thermocline is actually there. And what ends up happening is a lot of times you can fish in that general area. And what that is, is where the hot water and the cold water on the bottom tend to just come together and mix. If you've ever went swimming in the summer and just down by your feet, the water seems a little colder out in the old swimming hole or the lake. That's right. sort of the same thing. Uh, so, so that's a setting during the summertime you can actually use a lot and actually get a good reading on, on right about where those fish are going to be located at during the depth. You can actually go out and find structure or cover that's about the same depth level as that, that thermocline, and, and you can catch a lot of fish doing that. Uh, the other thing, you know, sometimes you can go out and, you know, there can be an algae bloom or there can be a, uh, there can be a, uh, there's a lot of, uh, oh my gosh, I just went brain dead. The little microorganisms <laughs> the shad feed on. <laughs> oh gosh. Phytoplankton. So a little time in that lake that I fish, there's always early in the morning, 
there's always this just, it's just cloudy. So you can actually take and adjust your contrast and kind of contrast those out. Now, sometimes the contrast is going to, if you, you're not careful, I always tell people a good starting point anytime is on, on the home and birds kind of sensitivity at, you know, let's say whatever, whatever it is. Let's say if you're running it out of 14 on sensitivity, you know, a lot of times two below on contrast is it'll give you generally what the way I like it. And everybody's going to be different. Everybody's going to see things different. Everybody's going to want a little bit different picture. I tend to like mine just a little dirty because I'm so afraid of missing things. You know, I don't mind a little bit of fuzz, a little bit of, uh, you know, interference because I want, I want to make sure I'm not missing something that I should. And that's just paranoia from using old school stuff. You know, it's like I was fishing with a buddy of mine and, I've got a four pound smallmouth on, on a Ned rig on six pound test line and I'm back reeling. He looks at me and goes, are you back reeling? I said, yeah, man, I'm, I, I grew up using Shakespeare's. So they didn't have drag. <laughs> you didn't trust <laughs> that. You know, you, you learned to back reel real quick back then. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I just, I, to this day, like I can have, I can have a $150 or $200 spinning reel and I still don't trust that drag. I've got it on back where I can back reel constantly. <laughs> so nice. Nice. All right. Well, I, I think, you know, as we go through all this, it, it becomes clear that these little pieces of plastic with a screen on them in our boats can do a whole lot more than, what we probably really understand and they can be a little bit scary at times you know i think and i think times people get really frustrated with them but it's important to take the time to learn these things if you want to become a more consistent angler on the water so obviously um you know your channel bass geek is a great resource and we're gonna we're gonna drop links in that for the people um, on uh, watching this on YouTube. It'll be in the in the description. We'll put some links up in the Facebook post when we when we put this episode out there. But what are some other really great resources for people to use um, in order to learn more about the specific graph they have? Uh, there's a ton of uh, honestly Facebook. Uh, there's a there's a couple of different hummingbird groups out there. I off the top of my head, I can't remember their names, but you know I'm always kind of touching base in those and and keeping up with those. Uh, you know, hummingbird, in my opinion, has one of the best support systems. You know, I've had a graph that I've had a couple of problems out of and sent it in, and they've been great with ideas. So you know, you you ever have issues, you know, hummingbird themselves generally is always a good resource. Uh, you know, and there's, uh, uh, there's a couple other YouTubers out there and, uh, uh, Hummingbird themselves, their channel, they've got some good tips and tricks out there. And one of the guys, uh, I think he's the sonar professor. I can't remember his Dr. name. Dr. Sonar. Dr. Sonar. Yeah, there you go. He's got some pretty good stuff out there too. Uh, he was actually the one where I learned about uh, the GPS not being accurate. He's talking about how one time he he tied his boat to a uh, to a floating dock or not a floating dock, but a, a, just a dock and left it for 24 hours and how it would move up to 25 feet in several different directions. He left the uh, graph on and the uh, uh, oh my lord, I'm getting tired. <laughs> the uh, the path, you know, whatever it's called, have mercy on me. <laughs> yeah, his track or route. The track, yeah, the route. Yeah, he left the route on, and you could come back and see how it moved. So it's uh, it, it was pretty interesting and pretty eye-opening to me. Very cool, very cool. Well, I think with that being said, um, you know, it's probably time that we we start kind of rounding this thing out you know you've uh you've explained to us how exhausted you are <laughs> so, <laughs> well i've told you all night how old i am <laughs> we want to we want to make we want to make sure you get your beauty sleep tonight so um as we start to close this thing out is is there anything that you want to share as far as tips and tricks of the trade that maybe we didn't get to tonight 
the last thing I, I will say when it comes to graphs, leave your rods at home and put your seat time in. Mm. Especially when your uh, summer, I always tell people summer and winter, I think are the most consistent time to catch fish. Because once you go out and you find a school of fish offshore, they're, they're there every single year, 90% of the time. I've, I've, I've been fishing a lot of the same schools and the, some of the same lakes for 15 years. And, you mm -hmm. know, they, they get dialed in to what you're doing <laughs> and you have to, you know, innovate and change. But, uh, you know, put your seat time in. Don't go out and buy those. And then if you're a weekend warrior, you know, when, when we get that limited time, we all want to go out there and just go catch fish. Sometimes your better days are going to be led up to because you put seat time in and you just went out there and looked at that graph all day long. And I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, I, I can graph all day. I mean, I can just go out there all day and just look at, look at the bottom, you know, and, and, and look at fish and, you know, you just, like I said, for a weekend warrior, you're going to, you're going to put into hyperdrive that, that learning about what fish do, how they migrate and why they are in the places that you're, you're maybe you've been catching them for 20 years. Yeah. That's a, um, that's a tip that I've, I've heard numerous times, especially from guys at the higher level. Um, just for one instance, I'll bring up another TRC team member, um, Major League Fishing Pro Michael Neal. Um, he speaks about this. You know, he would fish the the weeknight tournaments there on Chick and other lakes in the area, you know, throughout high school. And he would talk about they'd go way in their fishing while everybody else packed up and went home or sat around and talked about fishing. He'd go back out on the water for hours on end and just graph throughout the night. No fishing, just graphing. And so... And he's just one of many cases. So I, I think that's definitely a great tip um, to leave everybody with. You know, there's no sense in buying all of this fancy equipment if you're not going to learn how to use it and how to apply it to make you better on the water. Again, whether your goal is to go out and win championships or your goal is to go out and catch a few more fish on the weekend, same difference. Don't spend the money on this stuff if you're not going to use it the right way. Um, with that being said, you're dropping all types of knowledge all the time, Hank. So where can, where can our followers find you? Uh, I'm on, uh, YouTube of course is the, the, the biggest outlet generally. Uh, and, and guys, I, I always tell everybody, you know, I don't have subscribers. I don't have fans. I've got friends. I've got 28,000 friends. Uh, if you go look 28,000 and I answer every single comment. I mean, two, two, three hundred comments sometimes in a video, and I promise you I'll at least reply cool or thank you or something to every single comment. Uh, there's, I don't think there's a YouTuber out there that does that, and it's just simply because I'm so appreciative, so blessed to have uh, you guys, you know, the uh, my my uh, Bass Geek Nation, as we've started lovingly referring to ourselves and uh, – you know, it's like I said, I'm just a dumb country boy that likes to go fishing, man. And it's never did I think this would ever be a deal. But, uh, you know, uh, I'm on Twitter, Bass Geek Fishing, Instagram, Bass Geek Fishing, Facebook, Bass Geek Fishing. Uh, you know, I'm not twitching yet because I don't do math, but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but uh, that's that's maybe more of a local joke <laughs> where I live. <laughs> But uh, anyway, poor, poor joke. Anyway, I apologize for that. <laughs> I thought it was but, funny. <laughs> but uh, we are from you Indiana, know. you know. We've yeah, got yeah, probably yeah. like so, three of the biggest meth capitals of the world right here. Well, so. you know, or I'm. All right, Indiana. moving on, moving on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but uh, yeah, guys, you know, you know, follow me. Uh, sub, I mean. Uh, I've got an email out there. It's uh, uh, bassgeek.biteme at gmail.com. Uh, I, I reply to everybody generally. If I miss you, I apologize because the channel is getting bigger. Uh, I, but, uh, you know, if you've got questions, man, I, I always say at the end of my video, 
you know, questions, comments in the comment section below because I love to talk fishing. And I think I just proved that to both of you guys tonight. <laughs> I told you there wasn't going to be right. any dead time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. You got anything special planned for this year? Uh, well, you know, I keep telling everybody, I, you know, I, I kind of asked this in my last video. I asked some people, you know, if, you know, if they, you know, what they thought about maybe, you know, doing some things, making that leap. And I got a really good response. Uh, I'm not there yet. We're in the process of building the house. This is my old, this is my grandmother's old house. She passed away, um, 2001, left us this house. We're going to, we are unfortunately going to tear this house down because it's teeny tiny and, uh, build another one. So, you know, everything, everything with the, unfortunately fishing is on hold right now until we get that done. And right now we're waiting for the bank. So, uh, I was hoping I was going to get to fish the BFLs out of my boat this year. That's not going to happen. Probably going to have to take this year off, uh, just because, you know, it seems like every time I turn around when you're building a house, somebody is trying to pull your wallet out, mm -hmm. <laughs> steal your money. So, <laughs> you know, it's uh, that. I just want that to be done so I can get back into focusing on fishing. I'm, I'm so ready to fish and just fish, you know, long and hard. <laughs> right. With my graphs because size matters. <laughs> yes. I, think I, was do it. I had to do it. I, we were all thinking it. it. You just did I it. Know, I was. I'm just going to let our users out there or listeners out there just, you know, take their mind where it did. It, 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 <laughs> not, we didn't have to take it there ourselves. But. We got. But there. he did. <laughs> Well, uh, good luck on all that, man. And, uh, you know, I know that's, uh, that's going to take up a lot of your time and energy over the next few months, but on the back side of it, um, you know, it'll, you'll be, uh, you'll be ready to rock and roll and I'm excited to see what, uh, what you can do. You've definitely been growing this thing over the last few years and I've been watching and I know a lot of 28,000 other people have been watching as well. And it's been exciting um you got a lot of great support you want to you want to talk about any of those uh those fine folks that uh, support you real quick uh yeah you know i, I do want to shout out you know i just got my my lose order in you know I, i'm i'm partnered with lose uh partnered with uh, trc and uh you know bass munitions uh ledge ledge head swim baits guys that's uh he's a he's a very good friend of mine He's uh, super innovative in, in his swim bait head. Uh, I've got a ton of videos on them. They're his underspin. Uh, it's incredible what you can do with it and how diverse it is and, and how it's, how it's worked out for me, uh, in combination with the, uh, with the swim baits that I like to throw out ledge fishing. Uh, you know, um, you know, Connect Scale, uh, Opticast, they they make the uh, Pro Buoy system that I love so much. They're actually filled with foam. So, and I, I can't stress how important that is, guys. I don't care. You know, even if you go buy the cheap buoys, um, you know, that visual lineup when you're learning, it's huge. Um, I know I'm forgetting somebody. Uh, BassBoatSeats.com, they put uh, boat, uh, you know, seats and carpet in my old ragged tag, uh, 98 smoky Triton, uh, <laughs> you know, just, just anybody, man. There's so many people that have just been nice to me and helped me, uh, do things and, and share it. I, there's not enough, there's not enough hours in the day for me to thank everybody, including you guys for having me on. Uh, like I said, you know, without the, I always say the only thing that's special about me is the guys that show up every week and, and watch my YouTube channel. I'm just a regular guy. And the only reason I get to do cool stuff and hang out with cool people like you guys is because the people that watch and, you know, if I can do it, anybody can, I promise you that there ain't a dang thing special about my fat rear end. <laughs> so well, we appreciate you coming on and, and talking with us and, you know, sharing all this information with everybody. I thank you. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Well, I had fun. Absolutely. And we'll have to have you uh, back on uh, to talk a little bit about this uh, deep water swim bait fishing that you love so much. So that will have to be the follow up to this conversation. And uh, I'm looking forward to that one because I love throwing a swim bait 
and I know my uh, my good buddy Alan here does too. So that'll definitely be a fun one. Maybe we'll schedule that for when we get a little bit closer to that uh, that summertime bite. Um, so anyway, thanks for coming on the show once again. Um, thank you for uh, putting out all the great content that you do, and uh, we will uh, we'll catch you here soon, Hank. Thank you very much. All right, thank you guys. All right, have a good night, Hank. All right, everybody. So you know, if you've listened to our show over the last couple of episodes, that we have a section called Tough Bite. So we're getting ready to uh, to ask Hank the Tough Bite question of the night. Alan, take us away. All right. So earlier in the episode, you talked about you know coming into a cove or something like that, and and seeing a kayaker there, right? So coming from the bass boat side of things, right? And I've been out there, right? I mean, I've had bass boaters just pull right up on me like I'm not even there and want to fish my spot. What's your real take on this whole kayak thing? Right? I mean, it's everywhere, right? You probably can't go to a body of water now and can't come across a kayaker. You can't go to a show and not see kayaks. So you think it's a fad? You think it's you know, something real? What, your real take on this whole thing? Oh man, you are getting me started on something I've got a strong opinion about actually. No, in no way do I think it's a fad and I'm going to tell you why. We have priced out of the bass fishing world so many people. Now, I know in the kayak world, you know, there's kayaks can get expensive. And, you know, I hope the one thing that the kayak world doesn't do is, is what the bass boat industry has done. I mean, the average price of a brand new tournament ready bass boat is seventy five thousand dollars. Let's let's talk about that. Seventy five thousand dollars. I'm a network engineer. I'm not going to lie to you. I make some OK money. And seventy five thousand dollars. I you should bleep out what I'm thinking about that. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it's 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 crazy. Um I think we're limiting the sport. We're limiting the growth of the sport. Uh, we're limiting the amount of people. And I know there's some pros. I'm a big fan and friends of one of them who says, uh, and I agree. I'm, I'm a, I'm a guy who come from a very poor background. I believe you can do anything you want. If you put your head and your mind, your, your whole heart and mind into it. But at the same time, uh, I think that what the kayak industry is doing is uh is spot on and and i I honestly i I applaud them because i think it's opening up avenues to get some guys into you know different levels whether you just want to be a professional kayak angler whether you want that to be a launching pad you know into the mlf or the bass or whichever it new professional (laughs) boat version (laughs) there's going to be next year Uh, so that's my opinion it it really always has been my opinion you know me i've never had a kayak i've been in a john boat you know uh i would i'd like to have a kayak uh and and i do plan on eventually getting one for whatever reason my well i know why my wife just for some reason is dead set that i'm going to drown if i get a kayak (laughs) i don't know if she's had a dream (laughs) Or whatever. But uh, hence why I went with a small Pelican boat instead of a Pelican kayak. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but, but I think it's great, uh, you know, uh, what, what the kayak industry, what the kayak community is doing. I, I think it's, uh, it's opening up our sport to more people. And how can that ever be wrong? Sure, sure. So here's here's an offer we'll make you, right? Whenever you're ready, we'll work it out. We'll get together. We'll go all do a do a little episode out on the kayaks. All right, yeah, I'm all for it. And we'll be I there. We'll it. make sure you don't drown. Okay, there you that's go. fine. I, we may just tell the wife I'm 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 in your boat. That's what we'll say. <laughs> She's right, gonna, right. Does she watch the YouTube channel? Because this thing is going to go viral. I'm telling you right now. Bass she, Geek with the guys from Hoosier Kayak Bassin' in a kayak. This thing is going to blow up. She's going to see it. 
I think she just mainly watches the pretty intros I do at the beginning. Okay. Okay. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, there you have it, guys. Bass Geek's getting in a kayak this summer with Alan and myself. Stay tuned. Watch it. That's your tough bite of the night. We'll see you guys later. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening in to another episode of the Hoosier Kayak Bassin Podcast. Real quick, though, I got to talk to you about something. Are you tired of breaking rod tips are you tired of busting guides off your blanks are you tired of thrashing around your blanks and getting them all scored up and beat up if that sounds like you then you need to check out trccovers.com hands down the best fishing rod protection in the world these things actually protect your fishing rods not only that they're handmade handcrafted built in america not many people can say that anymore about their product veteran owned veteran operated does it get any better than that oh wait yes it does not only do they actually protect your fishing rods but they float so you can save your investment if you drop it in the water you need to go check them out trccovers.com use code hkb10 at checkout just drop it in the little coupon field there get 10 percent off your order trccovers.com check them out Are you looking for a premium fishing jersey this season that's not going to break the bank and leave you some money left over for entry fees? Well, if that's the case, then you need to check out 316 Active, making premium quality fishing jerseys at an affordable price. They look great, they wear well, and they're fully customizable. Check them out on Facebook, 316 Active. Shoot them a message, let them know we sent you. You'll get a 10% discount on your next order. These things are already great priced, so go check them out, 316 Active. Seriously, what are you doing? Go check them out right now. Quit listening to me.